Before we start, um, or actually as the start, usually the packet that I give out is much thicker than this with lots of scripture resource. Um, but for printing purposes in a group this large, we kept it smaller. So what I, I felt as I was praying for you is I made a CD years ago. Um, I, I've written a lot of songs over the years, but at different times I'll write scripture or, or create a song to scripture as a means of memorizing and getting it into my soul. Well, eventually I put together this CD that actually is only six songs. All six of them are, are verses. But then I gathered other verses around the theme of that particular verse so that there's six, seven to eight minute selections where all you do is listen to God speak and sing to you the scripture. The entire CD is from God's heart to your heart. Nothing directed to him or about him, it's all from him. And the whole thing is just loaded with verses. So it's a huge resource. And I felt like the Lord put it on my heart to give it to you. And so it's out there, you get to listen to it, you can decide if you want it, but it's available to you. So if you would now, this is the priestly blessing, I will bless you and keep you and make my face shine upon you. It's one of the longer verse selections, but I decided to do it because one of them is the, first, or is the Ephesians 1 that we did last night, and the other is Romans 8, 31 and following. And so if you would, just close your eyes and imagine this is from the Father to you. I will bless you, I will keep you, I will make my face shine upon you, I will bless you. I will keep you, I will make my face shine upon you, and be gracious to you, turn my face toward you, and be gracious to you. Father of your Lord Jesus Christ have blessed you in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. I chose you before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in my sight. In love, I predestined you to be adopted as my child in accordance with my pleasure and my will. To the praise of my glorious grace, which I have freely given you in the one I love. Who I am gracious to you and give you peace and give you peace. Yeah. 
If I am for you, who can be against you? Me who did not spare my own son for you, but gave him up for you. How will I not also, along with him, graciously give you all things? Who will bring any charge against you whom I have chosen? It is I who pardoned you. And who would condemn you? Christ Jesus, who died? More than that, who was raised to life, who is at my right hand, and who is also interceding for you now? Who will separate you from the love of Jesus? Shall trouble or hardship, persecution or famine, nakedness or danger or the sword? No, in all these things, you will be more than a conqueror through me who loves you. So be convinced, therefore, that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate you from my love for you that is in Christ Jesus, your Lord. For I, your God, am able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, you will have all that you need to abound in every good work. And be gracious to you So great I will keep, I will keep you, I will make my face shine upon you, I will bless you, I will bless you, I will keep, I will keep you, I will make my face shine upon you. Thank you for the assurance that you give our souls. Thank you, through Paul in 2 Thessalonians 3.16, you said, I am the Lord of peace, and I myself will give you peace at all times and in every way. For I, your Lord Jesus, am with you. Lord, I pray for that peace to settle on every single heart in this room. I pray that they would experience you today with your face turning toward them and not away from them. That they would experience you being gracious, gracious, gracious to them. And so, Lord, we receive your blessing today, your promise to bless and keep. Be gracious and give us peace. Lord, I ask you now that in the few moments to just set up our time to spend with you, that you'd help me to be clear. And I pray for the heart of every man in this room, Lord, that no matter how different, I pray that somehow, some way, they would trust, as Terry said, Holy Spirit intuition, that this is from you, and that they would trust you to love them. 
and that they would be unguarded because you are safe. And they're in a room filled with guys who are safe. And so, Lord, we give you our hearts. We open up to you our hearts. We respond to your love and to your invitation with gratitude and wonder. In Jesus' name, amen. Whew. I love God. And how much you ache for your friends and family and brothers and sisters, neighbors, co-workers, to know that love. To know the wonder of that love. <coughs> well, last night a number of you were asking, so how do we get loved? Well, that first day when I had the Bible open, I think I might have said that 1 John 4.19 was on this side, and he says, we love because he first loved us. And I said, Father, how do we get loved? And the bottom line is, is how does anybody know what's in the heart of another unless you use words and actions? You can have all the love in the world in your soul and heart, but if you don't say or do anything, no one will ever know it and ever experience it. So I looked across the page and 1 John 3.18 says, let us not love in word and tongue, and I'd put in parentheses only because we totally love with word and tongue. In the context, he's, he's focusing on action, but let us love in action and in truth. But the bottom line is it takes words and actions. So again, <clears throat> and here, just to hear the tongue, Words have the power of life and death, and those who love them will eat its fruits. The point is, is that words are not just to share information. Words are love language as well. Hallmark's made billions of dollars. And Solomon told us that that's the truth. Words, reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. How many of you know that the greatest lie that ever came out of the pit of hell was sticks and stones may break my bones? But there are still some of us who are still carrying the wounds in our soul, who still haven't stepped into the potential of who you really are because you still live under the curse of what was told you in the playground, in the classroom, and by a significant other. Words have the power of life and death. Paul elsewhere said, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their need, that it may benefit those who listen. That it may benefit those who listen. <laughs> okay, Lord, got to go off script real quick. But just to help you get this, one day, some of my kids came tattling. Dad, Josh, Josh was swearing. Dad, Josh was swearing. I said, oh, really? So next morning in family time, I got out my little dry erase board that I would use for counseling. I told one of the kids to get a dictionary, and I said, so, you're safe here, but tell me, what do you think is swearing? And I'm telling you dudes to keep a straight face. My kids said, and you're going to record this, right? They said them all. The F word, shit, asshole, bastard, went right down the list. And this is from three years old to nine years old. And I, Robin and I are trying to keep a straight face. And I'm like, really? Where'd you learn these? Well, everybody says them, Dad. So then I made them look them up. And so we opened up the dictionary and found out the F word is sex. And then that, that, that a-hole was where caca comes out. <laughs> and shit's caca. <laughs> and we went through the whole thing only to find out that all these words were simply normal words that had been elevated to some sort of hurtful position, but they were normal words. 
So in the other column, then I said, tell me what words hurt you. And then they started to listen. Idiot, stupid, moron, jerk, faggot, all kinds of words. And then I asked them, I said, and how do you feel when somebody says that to you? It hurts, Dad. It hurts. I said, these words on the left-hand side, in our culture, especially in our religious culture, these are not okay words to say, and so I don't want you saying them. But I mark my words, kids. If you say any of these other words on this other side, you will be severely punished because you can change somebody's sense of worth for the rest of their lives. So don't say these, but if you say these, you will be severely punished. Because these have the power of life and death. And you know, when I share this in a sermon, I said, you know what's killing me right now is that most of you are still sitting out there going, I can't believe the pastor said shit. (laughs) (laughs) And you know what kills me? Is not one of you are saying, I can't believe the the pastor said stupid. That's what kills me is you're still back at what I said, and that word is purely biological. But you call someone stupid, idiot, or moron, and you crush their spirit, and you're still back bothered that I said that word that has utterly no meaning. The tongue has the power of life and death, and so help us to guard what we say to one another. And the Lord knows this. He knows what matters. Now that took up some of my time, so oh God, oh God, help me. But I got to trust you needed to hear that. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times in various ways, but in these last days he spoke through the Son. And the main reason for putting that text there is simply this, is a huge part of what you're going to do this morning is you're going to speak. Because speech is a present activity. Speech is something that happens between persons. Speech has tone of voice. It has pace. It has volume. God spoke. Do you realize that until Gutenberg's press, the only way people experienced Scripture was hearing it? You realize when Jesus was out there on the side of the mountain, he didn't say, now open up to Matthew and let me read to you what I said once. Why do you worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, or about your body? Why? Why, why do you worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, or your body, what you'll wear? Is not life more important than these? Look at the birds of the air. They they don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet I, your heavenly Father, feed them. And are you not? Are you not much more valuable than they? And who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? That's how they heard the word. Jesus spoke. And you need to hear it spoken. How many of you know that you can sit there and start reading silently and praying silently, and within 10 seconds your mind has gone through 50 different thoughts, and some of them are going, oh God. (laughs) All cultures, until our recent culture, our written culture, all cultures prayed aloud, read aloud, meditated aloud, because it kept you in the present, and you could listen to it and listening was more powerful. But here's the coolest thing of all to me. Every now and in the early years, somebody would say to me, Mark, is it really okay to be doing this, allowing God to speak directly through the scriptures? I had no idea taking my father for four classes in seminary. My last one was the life of Jesus, how important this particular lecture was going to be for my future. But I remember Dad telling us when we looked at the Luke text, when in the Luke version especially, because it is personal in Luke's version, where the Father says, You are my Son, 
whom I love, with you I am well pleased. And what does the text say? It doesn't say that John the Baptist opened up or that God said, oh, John, say this. The Father spoke to His Son. Spoke. But the amazing thing in that class that day was to find out that that little statement wasn't simply a sentence of affection. That statement was fragments of Old Testament scriptures that also spoke into Jesus' identity and who he was. When he says, you are my son, is from Psalm 2-7, where he said, you are my son, today I have become your father. And Psalm 2, for history, eons, years since the day David wrote it, was understood to be the messianic psalm, promising the day that there was going to become a Messiah, an anointed one, who would be the fulfillment of the promise given to, to David and to Solomon. And on this day, the father says, you are my son. The second line, with whom I am well pleased, comes from Genesis 22-2, where God spoke, spoke to Abraham and said, Take your son, your only son, whom you love. You don't think that meant something to Jesus, being the miracle-born son like Isaac was, the miracle-born son who was being taken to be sacrificed? And now the father says, You're the son whom I love. And the last line with whom I am well pleased is Isaiah 42, 1, where God tells him, you're not only the messianic and future and promised king, you're not only the son whom I love, but finally you're the suffering servant whom I uphold, the one I've chosen, with whom I am well pleased. God spoke scripture to Jesus. Come on, guys, give me something out there. I know, you're really, you're pondering this, but it's, it's amazing, right? I mean, God did this for Jesus. Why on earth would he not want to do it for us? Why on earth would he not want to say, how great is the love that I've lavished on you, that you should be called my son, a son of God, and that's who you are. Amazing stuff. So God speaks scriptures to us, changing the pronoun in a verse, which is now <clears throat> open up to your in your notes to the second page there. Again, personalizing is, is simply this. And because I am born and raised in my father's household and I went to seminary, I know all about exegesis. I know that a word is in a sentence and a sentence in a paragraph and a paragraph in a letter or a book or whatever it is, and you need to know it in context. Most of these verses, though, are the highlight of that context. But almost without fail, any verse that I ever personalize, it usually has God in it somewhere. So instead of it just being addressed to God or about God, it becomes a verse now from God. That's the primary change so that God speaks as a person to you personally. That's what personalizing is. <clears throat> But I love this, Isaiah 55, 2. The father doesn't say, read, read. He says, listen, listen, and eat what is good, and your soul will delight in the richest affair. Listen, and your soul will delight in the richest affair. <clears throat> you can shut that off, because now we're going to go to here. The exercise you're going to do now says deepen your experience of love by meditating on his words. Number one. This is page three. Y'all with me? Yeah. All right. Top of page three. This means that you take time to soak in the words, to ponder them, looking up the definition can often help.
Number two, also you can look up synonyms and antonyms for the words that impact you most. In the verse below, the words delight, love, and rejoice are selected. Now let me tell you where this came from. And again, another biblical support for this. First of all, the New Testament, every, every scholar is translating Greek and Hebrew into English. When they do this, they always have numerous words, and they have to pick one unless they're the Amplified crew, and then they kept them all because <laughs> they couldn't make up their mind. In a sense, this exercise is your Amplified version. Why we have so many translations is simply because there are different ways of translating, and scholars have decided upon a particular word. So you can even create synonyms by just going to Bible Gateway and put up five different translations and see the difference and extract the words even from there. But it was the antonyms that was fascinating. There was a gal in my church who had been severely abused. She was the only girl, six brothers. She was in incest with a father, with an uncle, and two of the brothers severely, severely, severely wounded and broken. When I first met her, she would only communicate passing notes. So the first time we were doing these verses, none of the positive words impacted her. So she looked them up, looked up the, the definition, and then her eyes stumbled upon that in the definitions there would be synonyms and antonyms. And the first verse she was doing this particular time was that song, I will bless you and keep you. And she worked up, looked up the word bless and what's bless mean. She couldn't relate to any of the synonyms, but when she saw that the antonym was curse, put down, disparage, degrade, she goes, that I get. And you're telling me, Father, that you will never do that to me? And she wept and wept and wept going, you're safe? You're safe? And the place biblically for this is, is, is the, the mystery to me in some ways that people refer to 1 Corinthians 13 as the love chapter. Yes, it talks about love. But you understand that it starts off defining love as love is patient and kind. And then what happens? You have eight antonyms. Eight antonyms. It's what love is not. Love is not proud, it doesn't boast, it's not envy, it doesn't seek its own, it's not eagerly angered, it doesn't keep a record of wrongs. What's the opposite of record of wrongs? Grace. Forgiveness, grace. What's the opposite of being um, quick to anger? Patience. Patience. You know where the real list is? It's Colossians 3, 12 to 14. As God's holy people, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, he says what? Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Bear with one another and forgive whatever grievances you may have. And oh, by the way, you know what all those are? That's the facet of the love diamond. And put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. You want to know the real definition of love is when God passed by Moses, when he says, let me reveal my goodness and my glory to you. And you know what he didn't say? He didn't say 1 Timothy 6.15, where Paul says, God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal, who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen nor can see, to me be honor and might. No, when he passed by, he says, I am Yahweh, Yahweh, the gracious and compassionate God slow to anger and abounding, abounding in love and faithfulness. And I maintain that love to thousands and I forgive your wickedness, rebellion and sin, even though I just took you out of Egypt and dag nabbit if you didn't go and start worshiping an idol again. I ought to slap you upside the head. I mean, if I were Moses, I think I probably would have like freaked going, how can you possibly say that? That's the love chapter, gang. But the antonyms are there. Oh, I got to keep going. So, number two again. So you look them up. Zephaniah 3.17, in this verse, you see that I circled or highlighted three words, delight, love, and rejoice. Number three, one way, to, to synon one way to find synonyms, as I just mentioned, is to look it up in a Bible translation. 
And you'll see here in the Amplified and NLT, there's a several different words that don't occur in the NIV. Number four, look up the words in a thesaurus or in a synonym antonym book and list them as shown above. Well, this was when I first made this worksheet, that was before I had Google. <laughs> now I just go straight to Google and put in the word and say synonym of this or antonym of this, and man, you get all kinds of pages that give you all kinds of words. It's so easy. So you'll see there the words delight, love, and rejoice. The synonym of delight is enjoy, pleasure, joy. Gladness, the NLT says, cherish, savor, treasure. But the antonym is disgust, disappointment, displeased. I always thought that's how the Father felt toward me, discovered it was me toward me. Love, kind, tender, warm, and affectionate, the antonym, dislike or hate. Rejoice, celebrate, delight, be very pleased, cheer, exult in the Amplified Bible. The antonyms are grieve, sulk, or lament. So then what you're going to do is that you're going to have a worksheet that looks just like this, that corresponds whatever number you pick. There are eight worksheets that correspond to the eight verse selections. And what you're going to do is you're going to circle the words out of the verse first that mean something to you, and then you'll look down and you'll find the list. Most likely the word you circled is somewhere in the list. And then you're going to look at the synonyms and antonyms. Now before you turn there, we'll turn there in a minute. Hang with me. Stay where you are. But here's what I want you to hear from the Holy Spirit. There in 4a, it says, I, the Spirit of truth, will guide you into all truth. I love the fact that Jesus entitled the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth. And that he will guide you into all truth. As you do this exercise, may you please have confidence in your soul that the Holy Spirit will guide you in how to write and what words to write. You know, most of the time when people struggle with what they wrote, 99% of the time when they come and ask me a question, it's because what they wrote feels too, believe, too unbelievable to be true. It's not that it's heresy, it's that it's too good. They don't have the capacity to believe that God would actually feel about them that way and talk to them that way. So letter B there, it says, then write the verse again, interspersing the synonyms and antonyms to help you hear the text in a deeper way. Which once again, the main purpose of this as a meditation tool is simply the fact that every one of us have unique backgrounds and based on that background, one particular English word might impact you and another one may not. And the purpose of this is so that your spirit, your soul, will hear the verse in a way your heart will be loved by. It. So notice here, the bottom of the page then, is my um, version of the synonym antonym of, of Zephaniah 3.17. What's underlined is the actual verse. I am the Lord your God and I am with you. I take great delight in you. Mark, I enjoy you so much. You bring me such joy, son, such gladness and pleasure. So don't ever think that even for a moment that I would ever hate or dislike you or be disgusted by you. No, son, I treasure you so much. So let me quiet you now with my love, with my kindness and warmth and affection. For see, even now I rejoice over you, I celebrate and cheer over you with joyful songs. Isn't that amazing? Amen. Turn the page, and I've given you a couple more examples. Some of you might have picked Luke 15, 20, which is also, at the end of it, has Isaiah 40. Uh, I think it's 10 or 11. But I put these two in here because what's happened over the years is at various times, especially when I'm doing the weekends, sometimes I'll do verses I've done before, and I'll just go, Lord, what do I need to hear from you today? And what I was really fascinating to me was that depending on where I was, was how different the synonym antonym version was, just because of where I was in my life. So you know that here's the verse, right? When you get up and come to me while you're still a long way off and I see you, I am filled with compassion for you, I run to you and throw my arms around you and kiss you. Now listen to how I wrote this two different times. 
Mark, sometimes you stay a long way off from me because of how you see you. You withdraw and hide from me because you think that when I see you, I will treat you as you treat yourself, condemning, critical, disgusted, or disappointed in you. But I am not you. <laughs> Hallelujah, right? <laughs> when I see you, oh, and by the way, I see it all. The good, the bad, strengths, weaknesses, imperfections, and failures. But I don't feel disgust, disappointment, or anger. No, I am filled, not just feel, but I am filled, filled to complete capacity with compassion for you, filled with kindness and tenderness and mercy. And that's why I run to you, not walk, not wait, but sprint to you to reach you, to connect with you, to throw my arms around you and kiss you. Ooh la la. That'll get you out of bed in the morning. But now notice the difference. Mark, get up. And come to me. Draw near to me. You have no reason to retreat or withdraw. And don't be afraid. For while you're still a long way off and I see you, I notice that it's you. I fix my eyes on you. You see, I've been scanning the horizon, waiting, longing, hoping you would come. And now that you're here, no. No, 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 that you need not fear that I would ever ignore or disregard you. That somehow I would overlook you and not notice you. No, my heart swells until it is filled to the point of saturation with compassion for you. My kindness, tenderness, and mercy overflow with you and to you, Mark. For you see, the truth is, is when you come to me, I don't wait for you to arrive. I run. I sprint. I bolt to you and fling my arms around you with the strongest embrace and then kiss you, kiss you, and kiss you again with all my love and affection. Isn't that amazing stuff? Well, one day, one of my facilitators was working with a group of seventh grade Hispanic girls in Lawrence, Mass. And she had one of these worksheets, and one of the verses that the girls had chosen was the Isaiah 62, 5, 3 and 5, that you are a crown of splendor, a royal crown in the hand of your God. And she couldn't relate to a single English word on the page. So Tina says, well... So Jesus said, trust the spirit of truth to guide you into all truth. So you write it the way you think Jesus would say it to you in your words. So here's what she wrote, Isaiah 62. You are a crown of splendor, a royal crown in the hand of your God, and as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so I rejoice over you. So here's Jesenia. Jesenia, you are the shiniest piece of bling in my closet. Girl, you're a four-carat stud in my ear. As a baller trips over his shorty, I trip over you. I love you and spend my time thinking about you. They ain't nothing like you. You make the diamonds in my grill shine, and I just want to tell the world. Why, you're the sweetest shorty in the game. Me and you, damn, we like two songs and a jacked iPod. I can't do nothing but love you, shorty. You drive me crazy. Love, Jesus. <laughs> I had to go to her and say, can you translate that? <laughs> what the heck's diamonds in the grill? And then I found out it's when they put the gold and silver and, and jewels so that when he smiles, she sees. Still don't know what a jacked iPod. Stolen. Stolen. Well, how about that? <laughs> We're not going to go there, right? But let me tell you this. <laughs> Tina said that Jessenia got the biggest piece of, of, of poster board she could, and she wrote this whole thing out and stuck it on the back of her door and refused to walk out the door till she heard the Lord tell her who she was to him. And you want to know what? I believe God loves this translation. <laughs> because she hears the heart of the Father in this text. You can't ever teach from it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Especially in English class. But the point is, is that in this exercise, it's about learning to hear. To hear the love of the Father, use words from his heart to yours. 
And see, the beauty of this is that when I do, do this, I left my journal on my... What astounds me is how many of us do not journal. I don't know how you do it. Because I can't keep up with everything that's going into my life every day. And you know the worst thing? Sometimes I feel like God must feel like our Christianity is like 50 first dates. You wake up the next day, oh, hi, Lord. Like, it, like nothing happened the day before. And then you wake up the next day, good morning, Lord. Meanwhile, the Lord's got, you're my extreme makeover project, you see, and, and I'm working on a specific area of your life, and we have to stay at this. So the front of my journal, the most fun thing about doing this is writing the verses out is that I have pages and pages and pages of the synonym antonyms or the verses themselves, and I stay with it as long as it takes me until that verse gets into my soul and transforms me. And I don't care how many days I am in it, how long it takes, but the best part is you start collecting them, and you can go back and reread them, and I pull them up to the front so they're the first thing I see at the beginning of every day. You guys, what you're going to do this morning is really what I call preparing thanksgiving. You don't get this kind of time. Usually the synonym antonyms, when I do them, I do it on the weekend, because there's no time otherwise. But it's the <laughs> feast. And the time you take, you're going to take an hour to write out your synonym antonym version. And most of that's preparing the food. It's when you get into group, you're going to eat it. It's when you get into group, you're going to say it out loud first so you can hear the Lord actually talk to you through you. And the facilitators may say, oh, no, you're reading. I want you to speak the Father's heart to your own heart. Say it again. Somewhere the goal is to stop reading and start hearing. That's what we're after. And then your facilitator, when you are finished doing this, the bottom line is, is at the end of the hour, you must have somewhere, and you've got blank paper on the front, there's several places, but you need to write a legible version <laughs> for your sake so that when you're reading it, you're not stumbling over it, but especially for those of us who are facilitating who are going to allow you to sit still and listen to the Father love you through the words that the Spirit gave you for your heart. And your job is to be open and just let it happen. And see what the Lord does. You may touch pain. What I've discovered over the years so many times is that this stuff bypasses your cognitive thing and goes straight back into memories and history. You may hear the Lord say something like that and all of a sudden you'll think of some moment of shame or some moment of pain and you think, Lord, if that's true, then why? You may find yourself starting to tear up and to cry. Don't shut it down. Let the Lord love you where you are in that moment and let your brothers be there to love you too. The groove time is about being loved very concretely, very specifically through his word. I pray that you would drink and eat deeply. And then the best part of it is that unlike Thanksgiving meal, where you can eat it for a couple days and then you got to toss it, you put this in your journal and you can do what you experience today, tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day, because you can do it by yourself and you can do it with one of your brothers, you can do it with your spouse. You can feast as you will in the hour today. You can feast any day you want. It's your choice. That's the most fun thing I have about doing this, is that this isn't an exciting Saturday morning, and then it's over. What you're going to do in this next two hours, you can do every day and should do, from my point of view, every day for the rest of your life. Because again, in the same way that physically you must eat, drink, sleep, and exercise to thrive and live physically, your soul was designed and made to be loved and fed daily. And just as much as you wouldn't wake up someday and go, you know what, I feel a level of maturity. I'm not doing this eating thing anymore. 
It simply costs too much money, makes me fat, makes me sluggish, and I'm just tired of it. As ridiculous as that statement is, is as ridiculous to think that your soul does not to be, need to be fed every single day. Rob and I are a month away from 32 years of marriage. I have to tell people every now and then, they go, Mark, you do this thing on the love of God? And I go, yeah. Well, I know God loves me. I go, I know Robin loves me. So what? I'm serious. I know Robin loves me. The joy of being married is every single day the way that she loves me and I love her. It's the thing she says, the way she touches me, the way she serves me, the way that I serve her back. And at the end of the day, we celebrate the joy of loving and being loved. That's what marriage is. Yes, thank God he loved us and demonstrated it on the cross. But it wasn't supposed to stop there. Jesus loved them for three years having loved his own. You were built, designed, and made to be loved and to love as and because. And when you do, you remain in his love, brings glory to God and complete joy to your life. How dare we think that we can go a day without this? So may God bless you when you do your quiet time. You're going to pick a verse. <clears throat> You've already done that. Again, the corresponding worksheets now. The next pages are one through eight. Find the one that's yours. Is there anywhere for them to spread out? Or are we stuck here for now? Into the room? Oh, back here at 10. How, what time is it now? 9.04. All right? So you can sit here and do it if you wish. Wherever you want to do is comfortable. Be back here at 10. Let me pray for you. Wait, wait, don't go. And so, Lord, Holy Spirit, I pray, you who are the Spirit of truth, that you would guide them into all truth. And I pray that you would bless them. Father, especially for guys who aren't used to, to, to messing with words, they don't like to write. Lord, even if they only insert one or two words, it's enough. Lord, I pray they would not put pressure on themselves to, to make something masterful. This is just time to spend with you and let these words would have impact on their souls.